Therefore, all smoking activity is not allowed in our campus. Restroom is available at this floor, and then on this floor, you can find the restroom on my website. In case of emergency, you can find two emergency exits at this floor, and no elevator can be used during that moment. You could kindly spend some time to fill in our evaluation form after the event to help us improve and serve you better. And IGL provides scholarships for students that have parents who work at pharmaceutical companies. For more info, you are very welcome to contact our marketing department at the first floor. And the most important thing is, you are very welcome to enjoy the snacks and please enjoy the discussion as well. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome our program manager for biotechnology and head of research in the groups, Amenius Primo. Thank you very much, Nico. Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to I3L, especially to our guest speaker, Dr. Roger Fu, and also our CEO, Ibuyena, and our advisory board member, Professor Amin Subhanlio, I apologize. And also, all of our guests, thank you so much for coming, taking your time to come to I3L. Before we start the Power Talk, I would like to give a brief introduction about I3L. So I3L is a new higher education institute, and this is uh, one of the programs that we run every month. So Power Talk is a series of uh, seminars that we run every month where we invite uh, leaders and industry practitioners, academic, uh, academia, and also experts in the field to talk about uh, the latest developments in our senses. And we are fortunate today to have Dr. Roger Fu from Singapore uh, to come to us and share about his research in uh, clinical genomics, right? <laughs> All right, I'm going to give a brief introduction about I3L. So I3L is uh, stands for Indonesia International Institute for Life Sciences. And I'm sorry, Doctor, I, I, I apologize if I, did, if I didn't mention your full title. It's very long. <laughs> but, but I can assure you that this is, this is our privilege that Dr. Roger Fu actually uh, came all the way from Singapore to be with us today. So here, uh, here is a, a brief introduction about our institute. Our mission is to become the leading life science institute in the Asian countries by 2025. And our mission is basically education, research, and innovation. So we want to educate the next generation of life scientists in Indonesia and also create a formal international level of research and scientific publications and create new innovations that can be implemented uh, to promote the development of the industry in Indonesia. And it, I3L is a triple helix institute, meaning that we realize that to, to achieve our missions, we won't be able to do it ourselves. So we partner with government, academia, and also industry, both national and international, to basically promote education, research, and uh, innovations in Indonesia in the field of life sciences. So we have six study programs. We have biotechnology, bioinformatics, Bioentrepreneurship, food science, food technology, and bioentrepreneurship. And out of those six study programs, when we when our, when we started ITL, four study programs did not exist in Indonesia. So we were the first one to promote uh, bioentrepreneurship, bioinformatics, food science, and biomedicine. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> So again, this is uh, part of our mission. There are four 4,200 higher education institutions in Indonesia. There's so many of them. And we want to be different, basically. We want to be the red apple among the green apples. Even though I think there's actually more green apples than red apples in reality. <laughs> but red apples are nicer. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> so again, this uh, our talk is our monthly series of seminars and we basically organize this power talk to, to inspire, to innovate and also to integrate. So uh, the sequence is actually integrate, inspire and innovation. So we want to integrate for our students uh, classroom learning with uh, outside of the class classroom learning. 
So classroom learning means where uh, our faculty members come to, to the class and deliver the course, basically. And our talk is a uh, form of outside of the classroom learning, even though it's still in the classroom. But uh, the materials, the inspiration came from real practitioners in the field. And also, excuse me. And also, this is our effort to integrate the triple helix commitment between uh, academia and government and industry. So that's why we try to invite people from all walks of life, uh, all different types of fields, so that we can uh, basically have a brainstorming about the latest developments in life sciences. And the reason why we organize this power talk and we ask, we invite our students to come, is basically to inspire this, our students and also the public in Indonesia about this uh, inspire and educate about the latest in the flow in life sciences so that together we can think about new innovations that we can implement in Indonesia so that we can promote the development of industry, the development of healthcare and technology and life sciences in Indonesia. Okay, so I'm going to give a brief introduction to Dr. Roger Food. So Dr. Roger is an associate professor and senior consultant physician at the National Heart Center and the Cardiovascular Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. He also runs Singapore's first cardiac genetic clinic and is also a senior investigator at the Genome Institute of Singapore. Before moving to Singapore, he spent 20 years uh, of professional academic career in, in the UK. And today we will give a, a brief talk, not a brief talk, but uh, sort of like an introduction to translational clinical genomic research. So basically how we can bring research in clinical genomics into the patients. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Roger Fu. So the idea of giving a power talk is really quite incredible. Um, the word power suggests that you, you're all going to be really charged up. Uh, and I hope that will remain so with the momentum get it in the loud booming voice of most. Um, okay, so maybe just to gauge the audience, uh, I hope that there may be clinicians in the room. Is that are there, can you can you see a show of hands of any clinicians? So one, a couple. Maybe. Okay. Clinicians, practicing doctors, right? And then I guess uh, the scientists, of course. Yes, scientists. And then uh, managers and big, big people. <laughs> okay, so um, I've broken my talk up. So this gives me a gauge on how um, to pitch the talk. I've broken my talk up, talk up into three sections. Uh, so the first part is describing uh, the types of patients I see. Uh, and uh, then the second part is talking about what the idea is about uh, high frequency sequencing or what next generation sequencing means. Um, and then in the third part, I will show you how it's all coming together, I think, in terms of uh, what all these things are doing. So if the slide works, then my next slide is to give you a run through um, about where I've been and what I've done, uh, because it's always quite daunting to think, you know, who is this guy that's standing in front of you? Um, so I am actually a Singaporean. I was at medical school in, in Singapore uh, quite a long time ago. Um, and then went to Cambridge the moment I could. So I'm Singaporean, so I served my national service as well uh, after medical school, before going off to Cambridge. Uh, so in Cambridge, some of you know the system works on national healthcare system, which is the Ambrook is the flagship hospital of the East Anglia region, which is Cambridge. Uh, in Cambridge, we, I was affiliated to St John's College as part of the university. This is kind of a show off site, so you better not try. Uh, and then I managed to get this thing called the Wellcome Trust Fellowship, so I spent some time in New York, and in New York I was in Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So it was in this place where I kind of felt myself transformed from being a doctor, uh, seeing patients, to becoming interested in science. Because this building was very much scientifically driven, so there was a lot of website research and so on, so I got bitten 
uh, into it. Then uh, when I returned to Cambridge, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to become a consultant uh, and continue on the research that I was doing here in uh, New York uh, as a uh, research fellow under this thing called the British Heart Foundation. So the really nice thing I discovered about the, about the UK and have since come back to the Singapore, which is really absent in this part of Asia, is the amount of philanthrop uh, philanthropic um, in into research. So it's a very big thing in Europe. Um, so charities like the British Heart Foundation and also the Wealth and Trust, they're really big charities that try research. And a lot of the Nobel Prize winners in the West have been funded by charity, charitable organizations rather than governmental or, um, or, or, or any otherwise. Then ever since then I've been in Singapore. So, now that uh, I'm back in Singapore, um, I think only of, of Cambridge, so this is the bridge of size for any one of you who have been there, you might recognize this, and our lovely, lovely river where you know you can uh, sit on this thing called punt and uh, stay careful not to fall in. Um, I still go back to Cambridge quite a lot, so my family is still there and I still keep a small lab there, so if people can visit Cambridge, uh, I'm happy for you to come back and we can talk more about research and so on. But since being in Singapore, this is the thing that I see every night. Uh, no, I don't live here next to this one. But this is the thing that you can see much more, so, so more than buildings and so on. Um, so yeah, these are the three parts that we talk about. So dive straight in. Uh, so inherited cardiac conditions are, are inherited, uh, and the actual uh, definition of inherited cardiac conditions also means that it is rare conditions. So these are not your usual diabetic patients with a bit of high blood pressure and a heavy heart attack. So that's very common. That thing that I just described to you is common diseases. These inherited conditions are rare. They are Mendelian. So Mendelian meaning they're monogenic and they're inherited uh, down the family tree. So if you draw a family tree, it's very clear that there is an inheritance pattern to these diseases. Okay. So these diseases include, um, I break them down into three groups, cardiomyopathies, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and so on. So these are very technical terms, good traditions to understand these terms. Um, and they are rare, as I didn't put it, oh I did, so they are about 1 in 500 in occurrence. Okay, so if you want to say correct, rare, rare is a spectrum, right? If you say 1 in 500, it is quite rare. It's rarer than the number of people that get heart attacks, that get the infarction. Uh, but it is not that rare after all because you get 1 in 500 people getting attacked like this. And when you pull up these patients, you'll actually see it's running in the family. Okay, that's why it's inherited. And then the other conditions are aortopathies. So aortopathies affect the aorta. I should have also mentioned that uh, cardiomyopathies affect the muscle of the heart. So you either have this condition where it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the heart muscle is very thickened. So this is the middle muscle of the heart, for example. It's thicker than a normal heart. Or dilated cardiomyopathy, where the chamber is very widened. In either of these cases, the patient is suffering, I assure you. Otherwise, they wouldn't be called disease, right? And then uh, aortopathy is when the aorta, the aorta is the big blood vessel that comes out of the heart. So in normal people, uh, this is what it looks like. But in persons with aortopathy, they have the dilatation of the aorta. So the wall of the aorta is weak and it's dilated. Okay. So the very classical syndrome that you might have heard of, and we will talk a bit more about this, uh, and it's rare, but then again, the occurrence can be 1 in 200, 1 in 500, depending on which populations you go and look at. Um, there are people with Marfan syndrome. And again, it runs in families. Okay. And the last one are, uh, are the arrhythmia. <coughs> so this is electrical problems in the heart. Uh, patients can have um, uh, the runs of very fast heartbeats, palpitations. Um, you might have heard in the media about these Brugada syndrome, by workers, uh, young men sleeping in the night and um, dying in the sleep. So arrhythmic problems, electrical problems. Uh, a, a variety of these can also cause these issues about sudden death, you know, young people with sudden death. So young men, especially in Singapore, national service, running in the field, then dropping into the sun. So quite often, uh, if you look at these, these they may, it, it's quite often a combination or a selection of these conditions. Okay. 
okay? Inherited cardiac conditions. Now, I wanted to put this up here because I wanted to show you that in the West, as somebody was saying earlier in the introduction, it's a very well-developed um, series of systems where they investigate patients with these <coughs> conditions. Genetic testing is underpinned for these clinics that see patients like these. When you see patients like these, there is a genetic mm -hmm. test that you can do for each of these conditions. Okay? And there are guidelines such as these ones. So this guideline is as old as 2011. Uh, yes, 2011. So it's been revised over and over again, and the last revision was 2011. The guidelines tell you, you know, if you're a clinician, you will follow me. There's class one recommendation for some uh, things that you do in clinic, class 2A recommendation, 2B, and class 3 being not recommended. So genetic testing is re highly, highly recommended class 1 in patients with these conditions. So meaning that when you see a patient in the clinic, you are obliged, if you want to follow these Western guidelines, to be doing genetic testing for patients with long QT syndrome, uh, catecholaminergic, uh, polymorphic um, ventricular tachycardia, hypertrophic, and all these symptoms. If you see someone who survived, so this is out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, uh, survival, so someone running in the field and suddenly falling and completely uh, no heart rhythm managed to survive because they brought the um, um, defibrillator machine on board on time and they shot him and he survived. Someone like this, if it's class one that you really should do a genetic test, that's something that's very obvious. People are doing it the best. So shockingly, it's not really being done in Asia. And this is the, the, the reason why when I came back, I felt so surprised that Asia is not doing such a thing and uh, we are really falling behind if you want to think of it that way. So then, uh, if you have a family member, you must get used to how this person but uh, if you have a family member in, in, uh, with these conditions, then, then your relatives also have indications for genetic tests because these are inherited conditions. So we're talking about inherited. So, so you know, all of this is quite important. It's showing you the fact that um, there are recommendations in the West for genetic testing in a series of conditions. You know, not all of them. For example, atrial fibrillation is not recommended for genetic testing. Then the other thing to say is that because this idea of genetics in, in inherited conditions is such a mature field, it's been going on for 10, 20 years in the West. So much so that the genes that cause these uh, conditions, so cardiomyopathies, aortopathies, and arrhythmias, are already very well known. So each one of our bodies, we have 20,000 genes, okay? Amongst the biologists here, you should roughly know that, right? And it turns out that there are about 77 or somewhere around 100 where people know that these genes are responsible for the function of the heart. And if you have mutations that cause problem in the protein that is encoded by these genes, then you are very, very prone to develop these conditions, to inherit the conditions, okay? So in other words to say, if you see a patient that you suspect of these inherited genetic conditions, it's very straightforward, just test them for these genes. So that's what the West is doing, okay? How come we are not doing it? Then I'm moving on to high truth sequencing. <coughs> So, for those of you who haven't uh, caught on yet, in the past, so before technology became as advanced as it is today, in the past, when we do genetic testing, we are testing one gene at a time because technology was not advanced. The way to test genes is simple PCR, <coughs> Sanger sequencing. It's very like, laborious. And it's some, we all know that genes are long. And sometimes even you only can test one locus at a time. <laughs> And it's very uh, labor-intensive, very expensive, very uh, disappointing because if you don't find the mutation here, you go into another one, you go into another one, and then they accumulate. The price goes ridiculously unaffordable. And healthcare systems cannot sustain that. Okay? But today, technology known as high-throughput sequencing or next-generation sequencing 
is precisely why we have crossed that threshold. The West has already crossed that threshold, and they're using this kind of technology to sequence all genes in one go. There's no need to sequence one gene at a time or one locus at a time. You just do one test, and you've done all the 77. And depending on how you fix your panel, you can test 77, or you can test 100, or you can test all 20,000. Okay? If you test all 20,000, then that's known as whole exome sequencing. If you test the full sequence, so 3 billion bases, then that's known as whole genome sequencing. If you test 77 for heart condition, then it's panel testing. Some cancers have mutations in specific genes. They say some cancers have you want to test sequencing for 10 genes, then you make a panel for those 10 genes. So you can test multiple genes in one way to is that today we have crossed the threshold with this high throughput technology of being able to sequence many genes, as many genes as you want in one go. Okay? And it's really fast as well. So this is very outdated. Back in the year 2000, when Tony Blair, God bless him, and um, Bill Clinton came together and made the announcement that the world has finally sequenced the first human genome, year 2000, 2003. It had taken them 10, 13 years to get to that point, to sequence only one first human genome. 13 years to do that one. But today, we can sequence the whole human genome three billion bases in under three days. So the technology is breakneck. The, the whole threshold has already been crossed. So today, if you want, you can come to me and I can do your whole genome sequencing in less than a week. Okay? So that, that's the whole idea. It's gone so far beyond and incredible to think about. <coughs> and the other thing to emphasize is that these sequencing machines are so small. It's like smaller than your microwave machine. You put it in your mouth and you sequence all the bacteria in your house. <laughs> so if you are a Bill Gates or a Google man, this is probably what they are doing. You, are, you see what I'm saying? And it's really quick to do, really easy to do. Okay, then I thought I'd better show you the human genome because I've simplified it down so much, but I think it's obviously much more complex than that. So uh, if, you're, if you're an informatician, this would be a very familiar screen. Um, and informaticians are called geeks because they gaze at screens like these. Uh, and this window here is in this chromosome. Basically showing you all the genes that lie in this region of the chromosome. Okay? And then you will see, okay, so some of these genes are here, and there's another set of genes here. And there's a lot of empty space in between. So that's why I say the whole human genome is three billion bases. So when you genes, you're really only sequencing out genes, very short, one to two percent of the whole genome. But there is a choice with your microwave machine. You can sequence whole genome, only genes, only panels, that kind of thing. Okay, so I thought I would introduce this idea to you. Yeah. Then what I want to introduce next is what the actual analysis involves. Mm -hmm. So don't be uh, daunted, okay? I will take you through slowly. Uh, even clinicians can be daunted, I assure you. Yeah. Um, so our genome is basically made up of these nucleotide bases, and it's made up of four bases, A, C, G, T. It's an arrangement of these letters, A, C, G, T. Okay? And if you, uh, what you do is you sequence a person with the disease and you match it to a reference genome. So you go to the, you go to this reference genome in the internet. Uh, that uh, reference genome. And then you will see that your nucleotides match up really well because that's a human reference genome and you have just sequenced a human. So they should match up really well, okay? But at some places, they don't match up. So at these places where they don't match up, like this guy here is a G in the reference, but this person that you sequence is a T, okay? So in these places, they are called variants. So the idea is uh, there is across the whole three billion bases, variations at multiple points. 
And people believe that these variations is what made you look different from me. Like you have black hair, I have grey hair, you know, you are thinner, you are faster, they kind of and you know, why the West have blue eyes and we have black eyes, for example. So variation is what makes people different. It's a spectrum. Then you think about disease. So disease is when there is a mutation, or rather a variant, let's keep to that point, when a variant falls in a gene where the gene has a very important function. And if that variant changes the function of that gene, then that's going to cause disease. Does that make sense? So we'll give you an example. And then the other thing to say is that um, these nucleotides, these bases, are red in threes. So <coughs> they, they make up a, a, an amino acid. So the nucleotides need to be encoded and translated into an amino acid. So GAA is encoded into a protein called glutamate. Or glutamate. And then GGA is encoded to adenine. Then you remember this poor guy has a mutation in this C. So instead of ball type or reference C, he is actually a T. And because he's a T, instead of an arginine, he became a stop codon. So this protein is okay, and this protein turns out to be a very important protein, it's a factor nine. And so he's not got factor nine in his body, or is deficient of factor nine. And if he's deficient of factor nine, he will have hemophilia. So hemophilia is inherited disease. Okay? It's a, a disorder that, that makes people bleed very easily and they cannot clot. So, so that's the explanation. And that's the reason for doing sequencing. You're looking for things like that. You look for variants where you match up to the reference genome, and then you try and understand if this variant will disrupt the gene. And if it disrupts the gene, and the gene function matches the disease phenotype of the patient, then you suspect that that's the reason why the patient has a disease. Okay, so we're looking for these ideas. Then this picture is to show you how across this window, yeah. thousands and thousands of uh, variants in every one of us across the genome. Okay, I think the number, I don't know whether it's in the next slide, yes. Is 13 million. I told you we have 3 billion bases, but 13 million of these positions can have variations uh, from person to person. And then I thought I'd be clever to show you, but maybe it's really not worth um, doing it because there's so much detail. I show you, uh, this was meant to show you how in the past we would sequence one gene at a time, whereas now we can sequence all these single things are each represented by dots on this. Um, this platform. So you can really do you know high throughput multiple gene sequencing, multiple samples all at the same time. Each dot being a sequence, a sequence of a particular part of the gene. Then I, I added, uh, at the last minute I added this slide in because I was told that there were a few bioinformatics students in the in the room. So what we do is after sequencing we I told you we map to the reference genome. And then from the reference genome, we filter out uh, genes that are uh, different variants that are in positions that would cause that we think would cause problems. So there's a whole bunch of uh, algorithms, a whole bunch of databases that the world is producing. Uh, I think Asia should start producing our own because obviously our genes are very different from the West. Uh, and then with all these databases, you can reference them. And then you can help you make decisions of the patients that you see. Okay, so so this slide is really for the bioinformatics um, uh, people in the audience. Uh, in the end, what you want to end up is to find that mutation that you can then use for your patient. Uh, and hopefully, the subsequent slides will show you how we do it. So what? So why do genetic testing? Um, so this is the slide that I really push hard to try and rationalize to people what use this is for, okay? You want to do it because it really helps you to make a firm diagnosis for the patient. It's not just, oh, we did the ultrasound for you, I think you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But if you do a genetic test and there is a mutation, you are confident, definitely, it's a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? And then once you have that, you can decide whether the mutation is the type of mutation that will cause problems uh, very quickly whether you will deteriorate really quickly. Then it helps you to prognosticate and look out for future 
And then in some cases, you also want to counsel parents the intention of having a future pregnancy. Okay? Will that next child have the problem as well? And then in another case, you might also use it, as I said to you, really important for uh, families and relatives. So somebody with no uh, with relatives with no disease, obvious disease, you can use the exact same test to do the to do the uh, predictive testing. Okay, then I'm going to give you examples. This is Marfan syndrome. So Marfan syndrome, um, uh, our patients are individuals that are taller than normal. They have very flexible bones. Um, and do people know Marfan syndrome? Have you seen Marfan syndrome with patients that the friends in your lifetime? So they have, they may have a very abnormal chest structure, you know, either like a pigeon-shaped chest. There is criteria. That exists to help you decide whether when you assess the patient whether the patient has Marfan syndrome or not. But this criteria has been based on Western norms, Caucasian norms. Okay, so when I came to Singapore, actually the doctors that are seeing patients with Marfan syndrome, they're always very suspicious that this chap is a Marfan syndrome patient, but he doesn't fit the criteria of that was given in this table. And because he doesn't fit, he can't tell whether it's really Marfan's or not. Maybe because he's an Asian, so Asian Marfan's is slightly different from the best. So really, I think tests with the genetic testing would help, which is what we have been doing for them. So here's one example. This is a family tree. A man with very obvious Marfan syndrome is tested positive with a mutation in this fibrillin 1 gene. His wife is normal. Uh, and then this, once you tested this mutation, you can immediately use this mutation and test his children. And then you will know whether the child has Marfan's or not. And it turns out the daughter who's five years old is positive and has Marfan's gene. So she's going to be monitored more closely as she grows older. Okay? Did I tell you that Marfan's patients have a really high risk of uh, aortic dilatation and when you dilate? Uh, if you are also at risk of rupture, so the aorta can actually explode like a balloon. Okay, not funny, but, but um, that was a dramatic description. So that's why it is really worth knowing whether you have malfunctions or not, because you want to be followed up by a doctor, and you may want to be repaired surgically at your aorta by, you know, grafting and so on before your aorta ruptures. Okay, so that was one patient. Uh, here's another patient. Uh, another, this is really uh, more a family, right? So every child that was born in the family, the, the comments by all the uncles and aunties was if they look like the mother in facial features, they are going to grow up really tall because the mother has Marfan syndrome. And it turns out that, true enough, all the patients with Marfan syndrome are positive for this gene mutation. And there's even a cousin that has a mutation as well. And in this case, the child of this man, we're doing the gene testing for him to know whether his child has uh, Marfan syndrome or not. And this is an example of somebody that was in the borderline case. So it's, it's like one of those patients I told you about in this clinic where the cardiologist saw the patient. He felt that this should be Marfan, but he didn't meet the criteria. So we did the gene testing for him, and it turned out that he really has Marfan syndrome. So you reclassify the patient now as Marfan syndrome. Okay, then I'm moving on to cardiomyopathies. So this is the muscle of the heart, where muscle of the heart problems can give you, okay, I'll describe this one to you, quite serious uh, uh, conditions as well. This lady is from, um, from China, and she works as a uh, canteen operator. So. She just came back from work one afternoon, uh, very busy working at recess in the school. Uh, and all of a sudden, when there was a really loud kaboom sound in the living room, husband ran out because he was taking a nap in the bedroom, gave her the kiss of life. So he was very proud to tell us every time he comes to play, he saved his wife's life. But yes. Uh, then the wife probably got sent off to uh, NH hospital, which is where we work. Uh, and was discovered to have abnormal ultrasound in the heart. So the heart was clearly looking cardiomyopathy, looking dilated, looking abnormal. But she never knew she was abnormal before. Okay, and then we did a history, uh, we asked her history, asked her about her family history and so on. 
And then we had the sense that she had a brother in China who had suffered the same thing, where he um, passed out and had to be rescued. You know, this is like the out of hospital arrest and rescue survival. And it turns out that she has a mutation in this very well-known gene, NYPPC3. Okay, so then it allows you now to test this 14 year old son. The other thing to say is that because this gene is so malignant, it's really dangerous to carry on like this. What she has now is a defibrillator that was implanted in her, so that if she ever has this uh, episode of fibrillation in her heart where she passes out, if, if there's nobody there to give her the kiss of life and the, and the and these um, uh, com uh, compressions, then this defibrillator will kick in and hopefully help her survive. Okay. This is this was the ECG when when she came to hospital. Here's another very striking family. This is a Malay man who, who is a bus driver in Singapore, this man here. Um, the reason he has become a patient is because his son came into hospital uh, and died three days later in the CCU, in the uh, coronary care unit, with a very dilated heart. And he was only 25 years old. So he had normal heart, no previous heart attacks, no hypertension, no diabetes, very strong suspicion of genetics. Okay. Then we took a history, he died, very sad, passed away. Then we took a history and discovered that one of his cousins died at age 13 in the same hospital, at new age, okay, in the same uh, ICU. And also the father died in his sleep, the father of his child died in his sleep, very sad family. Um, and when this guy uh, uh, was questioned, the father was questioned, he actually is a bit out of breath as well. He's not a fully normal man, but he's also a bit wrong. So what we decided to do was do genetic testing on this family. Look, look at this family tree. When you draw a family tree like that, how can you not do genetic testing? In the West, done straight away. In the in Asia after last year, we were not doing it. Okay, so anyway, we did genetic testing, and he has a mutation in the troponin gene. Uh, and he had a mutation. His son, we had some blood sample, had a mutation. And now his 24-year-old daughter, whose heart is beginning to look at normal, has a mutation as well. Okay? Again, he's had the defibrillator implanted, because this is hopefully going to save his life if ever he had a problem like what his son had. <coughs> The, the not so nice thing is it's impossible to, impossible to predict at what age you would be caught out. If we could do that, then you know, we would have saved a lot of, a lot of heartache. So it turns out that actually this son doesn't have the mutation. We tested him, and then therefore this daughter was irrelevant, so she wouldn't have the mutation either. Okay. So it's really nice. I think we've really made a difference to this family. In fact, they even come forward for news news report in the Straits Times uh, not long ago, just to um, publicize this idea of genetic testing. And then another place where uh, genetic testing would make a difference is if you are involved in things like flying um, Air Force pilot planes, or worse, commercial planes that you want to fly into the, the mountains and crash your plane kind of thing. Um, and, and if you're a professional footballer, Having a, a condition in the heart and then doing a genetic test on it to define you one way or another is really going to be helpful because it will change your career forever. So it turns out that this guy, he was on the training, this is not the actual man, he's on the route training for the training squad for professional footballer, uh, but he has a mutation for, um, for cardiomyopathy, so he's no longer in professional football training. So another thing to say is that uh, there are genes, so I showed you a few malignant genes. There's yet another malignant gene. This gene is even more malignant, um, where patients really will die of sudden cardiac death. And a lot of them, a lot more of them die from this sudden cardiac death, from this mutation, than if you have just heart failure or heart attack. You know, you're even more prone to die of sudden death from genetics of this kind of mutation. So that's why these kind of things, I think, are really important. So this is one of our Western uh, families from back in the UK when we were running clinics like that, where we found that gene mutations are in ACG. Okay, then I'm changing gears completely. Yeah. I'm showing you the full panel, I think, I hope, um, <coughs> where gene testing can be relevant. I, I showed you the heart. Now I'm going to show you babies. 
And it turns out that in Singapore, the small island that we are, um, we have 40,000 babies born every year, both in private as well as public hospitals. Okay. And out of those, 1% of them can have these things called congenital disorders. It's very sad. A baby born to a completely normal father mother, and the baby has some deformities. Okay, so the deformities we divide into four groups: multiple congenital anomalies, so they have they can have a, a hole in the back of the spine, so neural tube defect, or they can have a hole in the heart, a cardiac defect, or they can have skeletal dysplasia, you know, abnormal skeletal system, or they can have cranial synostosis, so the cranial structure is abnormal, flat, very flattened head, or very widened head. You know, all of these are syndromes. So. There's actually no clever reason why they are classified into these categories apart from just convenience. Just vaguely they fall into these groups. And even more hodgepodge of a group is the group that is called intellectual disability. So these children are not developing their milestones. Mm -hmm. Let's say by three months they are supposed to be holding their head up. They are not. They are floppy babies. Mm -hmm. By one year they are supposed to be standing and walking. They are not. So developmental delay and intellectual disability. Okay. So it's really sad when a baby is infected with this, especially when the parents are normal. Okay. So again, I think sequencing is revolutionizing the management for these patients. And I'll show you some examples uh, soon to come. But before sequencing existed, these patients would be tested with things like CT scans, uh, blood tests, urine tests, you know, biochemical tests. But, and, and in all of these cases, without the genetic test, you can really only up to 5% of the time. Okay? And again, if you can make the diagnosis, it really would help a lot of things. We've gone through this reason why. <laughs> so what we have been doing for this hospital called KK Hospital in Singapore, if all of you are familiar with the landscape in Singapore, KK is the mothership um, maternal and baby hospital, child hospital in Singapore. Uh, and all of the babies with congenital disorders get referred to this one clinic, the genetic clinic in Singapore. So we have been assisting them in doing genetic testing for these babies. And the way we test them is this thing called trio sequencing. We sequence the father, the mother, and the affected child in the hope that you can predict what happens to the next child because that's always the worry that these parents have. Okay? And in often cases, the parents are normal, which is why it's uncovered for the Okay, then I, I'm showing this. This is, a, this is another show off slide to show you a lot of things, uh, a, a lot of these patients by these things called whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. Okay, see, I was, it's just to test run ourselves. It's like being on the treadmill for me, trying to understand what capabilities we have and how we can train our pipelines to do these analyses. Okay, so bioinformatics is very important. And look at these um, percentages. In all of these 26 families, so uh, we sequence 20 trios, trios, I told you, father, mother, child, trios. Uh, in some cases, we sequence by six child only because we didn't have the parents' blood. Uh, but in all of these 26 cases, we think we have solved the problem in 10 of the 26 cases, so 38%. We think we've increased the diagnosis rate from 5% to 38%. Okay, and here's some of the examples of the solutions that we have. So each one represents a child uh, and the mutations that were found in these children. So if you find a mutation, it matches up really nicely to what these children have in terms of what you're finding and seeing in, your, uh, in front of you. Then we, we think we have changed the diagnosis. Okay, so does it affect the management of the patients? Yes, it does, because I will show you some examples. Because what it does to you is tells you this is the syndrome that the patient has. And by knowing what the syndrome is, you can also look to see whether the parents carry the mutation. <coughs> and if the parents do carry the mutation, you can help to make a prediction of what the next child, the risk of the next child having the same thing would be. Okay? And in all this doing, I learned this thing called de novo mutation. De novo mutation. So it turns out that a lot of the times, up to, what's the percentage? Up to 6 out of 26 percent of, the, uh, of 6 out of 26 cases, the parents did not have the mutation. 
the mutation was only found in this per child. Then I looked into the literature, and really it's only in the last two years where people have been discovering this. The fact is that in every generation, you can have mutations occurring up to 77 places in your third 3 billion places. It sounds like a really high number, right? It's actually the mutational drift. It is what's helping you know, uh, the species to change over the millennium. Okay, that's the idea. But if any of these 77 genes, uh, 77 mutations fall in important genes, then this poor child is going to have a syndrome even though the parent did not carry that mutation. So this is de novo mutation, okay? Then when it's a de novo mutation, you can quite confidently uh, uh, advise and counsel the parents to say that your next child is unlikely to have the same problem as this child, unless lightning strikes twice at the same place. Okay. Here's some examples. So this child is four years old, she's a girl, she has gross developmental delay, blue eyes, and she has open mouth, protruding tongue, she was not speaking at four years old. It turns out that she has uh, these things called frame shift mutations, and it's de novo, it's not found in parents. And then when we went back to the doctor that saw this patient, and said, this is the mutation, and it, it links to coffin series syndrome, the, the doctor said, oh yes, we should have thought of that, but really, all the literature is Western babies with Coffin Series Syndrome. This was an Asian child with Coffin Series Syndrome. So she said, yes, actually, the baby that she's looking after, a four-year-old girl, looks like one of these children here. Okay? So if you knew it was Coffin Series Syndrome, you would only sequence this gene. But you didn't know, so you went <coughs> and you found it. Okay? Here's another patient. 13 year old girl, global developmental delay, small skull, small brain, cleft palate, long narrow face. You see how complex these phenotypes are. It's not this simple thing like a cardiomyopathy or a heliopathy. It's complex features. And it turns out that there's a mutation in the CTCF gene. And it's in the novo. And again, the patient looks like one of these uh, Caucasian children. Okay? And again, the action is that we are able to assure the parents. If not in every case, you can do something for this poor child. Basically, the gene is the gene, you have it, you cannot change anything. You may be able to change management somehow, and I'll show you one slide where that, that was possible. This poor patient, six-year-old boy, fine and gross motor delay, speech delay, etc., has two mutations. And again, you know, in the old days, if you found one mutation, you may sit down and be happy, because you won't bother to find another mutation. But if you're testing all genes at the same time, you'll find if there are six mutations, you'll find all of them. Okay? That makes sense too? So again, it's the local mutation. This is the MRI of the patient's brain. And you see um, these are abnormal size of the ventricles of the brain. Okay, this next slide is the one where I think we, we made a difference, a strong difference for this patient. Because this patient presents with uh, intrauterine growth retardation, so he's born a very small baby. Prematurity, and most of the problem here is bony problems. Uh, so we did a gene testing, and the mutation is here. And it turns out that this is a syndrome, osseous means bone. Uh, osseous dysplasia, so it fits the, the baby's um, description, fits the baby's diagnosis. But actually, patients like these are also immune deficiency. So as life goes on, you really need to monitor this patient for um, infections that they cannot cope with because they get immune deficiency. And actually they may be, she may be, he may be developing, beginning to develop that because he was getting recurrent bronchitis. But if you didn't know that it was uh, immune osseous dysplasia, you would just be focusing on the bones. But now we know this is the condition. The clinicians are also going to focus on the immune system and monitor this baby for infections. Okay, so places like that, I think we have made a difference. Okay, uh, it's running up towards the end now, I think. So I've showed you inherited cardiac conditions where we target sequence 77 genes. I've showed you what those uh, sequencing technology is like. Uh, I've showed you how we sequence congenital disorders, meaning all these babies. 
And then I think I've showed you how it makes a difference to the patient and then also to the families. But actually, what's even more aspirational is this thing. It's also making a difference to therapeutic discoveries. So if you're really entrepreneurial in thinking, this might be something that's really fascinating to, 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 to become aware of. So these are genes that people have found um, in very rare families across the world where they have mutations and they cause problems in these families. Okay? And these are rare conditions, rare families. Okay? And I'll give you examples of them. But when they found that the mutation is in this rare family, with this condition, the rare condition and the mutation can actually be used to apply to common conditions of very similar nature. Okay, then I'll give you an example. Here's a, here's a family that had mutations in this gene, SCN9A. The gene has another name called NEF17. So this is actually the same gene. And these families have no pain perception. It's ridiculous to think, right? I think they're from Europe. You burn them, they would scar, they have no pain. They do not have any pain perception. Look it up on the internet, it's most incredible. I was in Cambridge when they were publishing this, and the professor in Cambridge is one of the investigators. Everybody stood up and you know, with eyes open like that guy there. These family, families do not have pain perception, and the mutation turned out to be in this gene. And the drug company, very, they were very cleverly patented this idea beforehand. The drug company is now targeting this gene for treatment for pain relief for the rest of the world. So this is how you use a rare condition, something that you find in a rare condition, and turn it for the use of common conditions. Okay, isn't that inspirational? You think that that's possible? Okay, then here's yet another one. So these are families with mutations in this gene called PCSK9. So PCSK9 turns out to be this thing called pro-protein convertase subtilisin casein type 9. If you're a clinician, you usually don't bother with these things. Um, okay, but patients like these, if you have a mutation, you either inactivate mutation or a loss of function, uh, so inactivating loss of function mutation or gain of function activating mutation. And in neither cases, it affects cholesterol. Okay? So prior to all this, nobody had an inkling that PCSK9 was in the cholesterol pathway. But because these families were found, they found that PCSK9 is the thing that runs in these families that give them cholesterol problem. So now the drug companies are targeting this gene using a monoclonal antibody to treat cholesterol for the rest of the world. Okay? I can see a few entrepreneurs and people in the, in the audience already lighting up. Okay, then uh, the next step to go to is this idea of um, uh, other approaches for mandated disorders. I'm happy to pass this, some of these slides on to people if they want. This is a really nice review to show you and, and uh, this is the really nice thing, where the condition known as Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy quite often involves a mutation in this particular exon of the gene. Uh, and the mutation causes a problem with the gene that buggers up the gene. It makes the gene faulty. Okay? And these clever people invented a way where they did, um, produced a oligonucleotide that matches this part of the of that gene and hides the gene, this part of the gene, so that the protein is now translating across and skipping this faulty part of the exon. And in so doing that, it actually helps the patient with the muscular dystrophy somewhat. It doesn't cure, but it actually helps reverse some of the problems that the muscular dystrophy so yet another reason why finding mutations can actually help patients, develop, people discover treatment for patients like these. Uh, and then I have to go on to what I do uh, as research, which is actually very different from this kind of clinical translation. Uh, my lab's research is very epigenetic driven uh, and epigenetic focused, so I'm happy to talk more about epigenetics to other people offline, uh, uh, maybe another time. But you know, someone like Merrigan in the lab, we took normal parts of the patients 
uh, and disease parts from patients that are going for a transplant. And we did epigenetic mapping. We were one of the first in the world to publish this so-called epigenetic map of the heart, the human heart. And then uh, much more recently, we've been doing things like so to do publish things like mapping the epigenome of the heart, you need high throughput sequencing. The reason I'm putting these things up here is because I'm showing you that back in the UK and back in Einstein in New York, I was using high throughput sequencing, not for patients, because the patients were already being taken care of by all the other doctors that do that there, you know, for the last five to ten years. I was using high throughput sequencing for research such as these things. And then when I came to Singapore, I decided to discover that no is using high throughput sequencing for patients, which means we have to do that. But I am still using high throughput sequencing for experiments such as these. So one <laughs> a single cell into this microfluidic chamber, um, and then we extract the RNA, we make cDNA, and we see a single cell. So it's basically single cell transcriptomics. And then by doing this, if you sequence thousands of single cells, you show how each cell is different from another. There are subsets of cells that are different. And going from all of that, uh, we are building up things like gene networks. Okay, so this is all very aspirational stuff that is research driven. And again, as I say, happy to talk to people about it. But one of the drives that I think um, the world is trying to get to is this idea of cardiac regeneration. Is anybody familiar with cardiac regeneration as an idea? So it turns out that all of our hearts are uh, not actively dividing organs. It's not like the liver. If you cut a slice of the liver, you get replacement, and then the liver grows back. Not like the skin where you get a scar, the skin will grow back and your scab falls off. When you get a heart attack, a part of the heart dies, there's a lot of fibrosis around there. The heart, if the heart can grow back, and fill up and cover and then fibrosis can disappear, the world's heart failure, heart attack problem would have been solved, right? But that's the problem. The heart cells do not divide. They do not divide to replace the lost cells from heart attacks, okay? So all along, historically, maybe up to about five years ago, that was what we understood as biologists in heart disease. Heart cells do not divide. The moment you hit your, your, your um, some age in your childhood, the heart that you have, the size that the heart that you have, will remain the same the day you die. Whatever cells you have there will be the same when you die. They do not divide. That's the big thing. But actually, more recently, people have come up with experiments to show that there is ongoing slow replacement. So cells are actually <coughs> dividing in the heart. Human cells, human heart cells are actually dividing, but it's slow. And when you have a heart attack, the division is not high enough to replace the heart attack. That is the trouble. So there's a lot of drive at the moment. If you're in cardiovascular research and you want to do the most advanced research possible, this is the area where the world is really driving a very tough race to find ways to up the division of these cells. Because once you can get cells to divide, then you really can solve the world's problem of heart attack. Okay? And so part of the research in the lab with all these single cell transcriptomics and all that is to understand whether we can use some of these genes to drive the division of the cells. And this is the show-off slide to show you what we've been doing in that lab. Um, and, and we think we might have some of the answers, but, but to be proven. So okay, really summary slide now. I showed you how uh, in, in inherited cardiac clinic conditions, uh, uh, we are immediately applying genomics. And it's also been applied in the uh, program for babies, which we call CCDS, Sequencing on the Dental Disorders in Singapore. And it's immediately relevant to patients and families. And then there's also the aspirational things that we think about of whether these can bring new therapeutic discoveries in the future. And this is my people that work with me in GIS. Thank you. Thank you very much for the inspiring session. Now, we would like to open a uh, discussion and we welcome three first participants to deliver the questions. You can use the microphones in front of you by firstly pressing the button. Yeah. 
Yes, yes. Uh, so I would like to ask you as a consultant, some patients are reluctant to do genetic testing because they fear that the insurance company wouldn't pay for their health insurance. How would you deal with this? So this is a very country-specific issue. Um, and every country will have to come up with its own policy. One way to deal with it is to ignore it and hide your head in the ground, uh, which maybe some countries are doing. But in the West, what they have done is they've got the insurance companies. So the insurance companies are usually gathered in associations. So there's an association of life insurance companies. And you know, AIG and all these big insurance companies, they are always members of these kind of associations. So in the UK, for example, they, the scientists created a forum together with the association. And then in together, we also uh, engage the policymakers from the House of Commons, so the MPs, and they came up with a decision and agreement that there is such a thing known as a moratorium. So they will put a, a, a bar from insurance companies asking people about genetic testing. And the moratorium run, at first it ran up to 2015, I think, but now it's been revised and it's given a further date. So as long as time goes on, there is a strong persuasion, the moratorium, I think, will continue to exist. Uh, and the same thing has happened in the US, um, except for two conditions. One is Huntington's disease, and the other, I cannot remember. Maybe I cannot remember. So they, they gave two um, exceptions. I don't know the logic to that one. <laughs> Yes, yeah. very interesting. I enjoyed it. Uh, you have shown those diseases, which you call congenital diseases. Uh, is it possible to test parents to be and exclude marriages which with, uh, say, high risk for getting those uh, congenital diseases. Yeah. So there, there are two conditions for wanting to be able to do that. First, if you know what condition you want to look for, that would make your life so much easier. Because if you go for a fishing trip in the normal person, it's very, very risky. Because all I showed you that in our 3 billion bases, we can have 13 million variants. And a lot of these variants, because we've only started sequencing people in the last 10 years, we haven't had enough knowledge of each one of these variants, whether they really will cause disease or not. So when there is enough information on that position, then that's really useful. But in places where there's no information, you are really stuck. And patients don't like to know that it's a gray area, right? They want to know whether it's black or white. So at this point in time, that's why my view is that it's still not safe to sequence a normal person, healthy person. Because what you reveal and what you find there, you may not be able to interpret. If you find that already has been found by thousands of people before, then Thank you. 